Hello and welcome to Behind the Bearcat is the podcast where the Northwest Missouri State University Career Services Office chats with Northwest faculty, staff, students, alumni, and friends to hear about their career journeys, how they got to where they are, and how they became Bearcats. I'm Northwest Internship Coordinator Travis Klein. And I'm Hannah Christian, Director of Career Services here at Northwest. And today's guest on our show... Hello, I'm Tara Fike. I'm the Assistant Library Director for Access Services over in B.D. Owens Library. Woo! Welcome. So to be here, Tara. <laughs> um, yeah, so welcome to Behind the Bearcat. First of all, we know what a library is. I mean, that's pretty easy to understand. What in the world is Access Services? Yeah, I'm still trying to figure all of that <laughs> out, too, now. Um, I'm going on eight, nine years, eight years almost nine years. Um, but it really, it really just means the, the, when it's, when you say access services, it's the access. And a lot of times it's the physical access. Um, so the circulation side of the library. So the incoming and outgoing of our library materials is overseen in the access services department, as well as the oversight of the building, the facility, um, the spaces that we loan out to students and just the whole, the general, um, public spaces as well. Um, and then um, the oversight of our student employees who provide that face-to-face -face service to our students, faculty, staff, and community members who come into the library. Awesome. So how did you get this job? Did, tell us a little bit about yourself um, and how you got into this role. Um, it's a non-traditional path. Um, I actually started in my undergrad down in South Missouri in, in the psych uh, psych psychology department. Um, and then I went on to pursue my master's in counseling and guidance from UMKC. And while there, um, I applied for actually Northwest didn't have internships because they don't have a counseling program. They have the school counseling program, but they don't have the um, individual counseling program that I was in. And so I asked the counseling department or um, unit here on campus at the time it was um, personal development and counseling services, if they would be open to having an intern because my husband's job was bringing him to Maryville, um, which is also where I'm from. And so they said, yeah, we would love to have an intern. And so I interned here at Northwest uh, when I was completing that counseling degree. And that's when I, that's kind of how I made it to Northwest and I fell in love with it. And so I completed that master's at UMKC and then immediately applied for the um, higher ed leadership master's program here at Northwest and completed that. Um, while in that program, I started working in the library as the library GA. And it's funny, I joke about it now because libraries have been a huge part of my life. I have a, a grandmother who was a public librarian. We'd spend summers in the library. Um, and my undergrad, that's where I lived, especially once I lived off campus, was in the library. But I never, it just never occurred to me to work in the library until I had that graduate assistant position. And then, yeah, it's, there was no looking back after that. Yeah, fun fact, people actually work there. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, you go in and you're like, oh, somebody's at the desk. But you'd never think of that as, like, a, a career, career path. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We've heard that from so many people that work at Northwest. Like, you know, you don't even think about there are jobs at the college you could do after you graduate. And it's like, yep. it's a lot of us that fell into those jobs and we didn't purposely do it. So, yeah. Yeah. And part of that, I guess I forgot, like, forgot, but a big part of my experience while I was at UMKC was as an academic advisor. And I loved working with college students. And so that's part of why I wanted to pursue a an internship here at Northwest because I wanted to continue that work with college students. Um, so, yeah. okay. So I let's speaking of internship. I want to hear more like details about this story because I tell students all the time that you don't have to go out there and search for internship openings. You can just make your own, right? Like you can just ask for opportunities as an intern. So can you kind of like give us some details about how did you, who did you go to to ask about it? Like, did you take a resume? Mm -hmm. It was, um, it was interesting. I worked with my advisor at UMKC um, explaining my situation 
um, that we were moving. Uh, I wanted to stay on a college campus. And so they were like, well, why don't you just reach out to the um, director at their counseling center? And so I did, I of course CC'd my advisor. So they knew I was like legit and part of, it was part of an academic program. And it was really about making a case for what I could bring to their unit. Um, and also just kind of the, the opportunity to learn. One of the things that was really appealing to me, we, she doesn't work here anymore, but L Rhonda Leslie used to work in the um, Personal Development Counseling Center, and she's a Gottman therapist. And at the time, Gottman was, um, or he's still, I'm still very passionate about the Gottman theory, but um, I wanted to work with a counselor. I wanted to have a supervisor who had that experience and who was Gottman trained. And so she was very appealing in that respect. And I learned a lot from her while she was here. And so I just, I presented the idea. And um, at the time it was um, Tim, Tim, I can't think of his last name right now. Um, it'll come back to me in a minute, but who was the director. And I just sent him an email with my um, advisor on there and explained our program, our requirements, the supervision that we had from our academic unit um, and the type of supervision needs I would have. And I just had it all mapped out for them. And they, I mean, there was like little to no hesitation. They were very receptive to the idea. Yeah, it's amazing how many people when you say, would you like some help? Yeah. Actually would like some help. It's funny. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So you mentioned it, you're from Maryville originally or from yeah. the area, and then you went to school somewhere else. So, so how did you make the decision where to go to school and where did you go to school? Um, so I wanted to like get out and spread my wings a little mm -hmm. bit and, but not too far. So, <laughs> and I had an aunt and uncle who lived in South Missouri. And so I went to Missouri state and are on a campus visit and there, I met with their academic department and the psychology department, and I just loved the program and the advisor or the, well, I loved my advisor, but the faculty that I met with, uh, I got my first little taste of working on a campus as a student employee in the psychology department, actually in the advising office. I was the receptionist as an undergrad student. Uh, and that's when I really got my feet wet with, I think I can make a career out of being at a, at a university, which, you know, is kind of a joke now because my parents still say that I'm a perpetual student who's never going to actually be done. Um, and that's probably true. <laughs> but um, that, so, yeah, I just wanted to kind of, exp I wanted the opportunity to spread my wings a little bit and get away from home, but I was not quite ready to go too far. So I still wanted to stay in the state. Um, and I really liked the program that they had to offer down at South and um, it was Southwest Missouri State, but now it's Missouri State. Had you always had psychology? Like, had that always been your interest? How did you choose your major? I chose it before I went in. Um, as in high school, I took a half a semester psychology class and just fell in love with the, the um, theories. And, and it was like, it was bare bones psychology, you know, the high school level, we, you know, did the Myers-Briggs and like our whole semester was dedicated to that. Um, so it was just a teasing, but it really got me interested uh, in that field. And so then I went in as a double major in psychology and theater because my other passion was theater. Um, but I found quickly that I was fine when it came to acting, but I have no vocal capability. And um, I decided that I, I wasn't gonna make it anywhere with those musicals that were the big productions on campus. So I opted to drop that double major because I knew grad school was my next step. Going on and getting my master's was my career, my next career goal. And so I was like, do I wanna slow up that process um, in getting that master's in counseling? So. And so actually you use both of those in a library. People don't know, right? You have a lot oh. of psychology, a lot of theater. <laughs> yeah, oh, for sure. Um, the psychology, I mean, I, I even use Gottman today in my leadership. Um, Gottman, not to get into like the counseling world, but it's a, it's a couple's counseling theory, but a lot of people have amended it to just relational in general. And so it's a lot, you know, we can bring that into our team meetings and how we connect and engage with one another, um, to be effective communicators as a team. And so I use it a lot in, in my leadership role. 
What does a day in the life of the director of access services look like? <laughs> um, if you ask my husband, he would say, you're just in a meeting all day long, but it's different people. Um, and it's, it's true. I am in a lot of meetings. Now, I will own that part of that is me raising my hand and volunteering for all the committees that I sit on. But um, I'm involved in a lot of different library committees and a lot of different university committees. And then in the library, we have what we call a consortium of libraries where we share materials between the libraries. And I sit on a couple committees for that as well. Um, so I do have quite a bit of time engaging with um, committee members working on projects for the university as our university specifically or for the library specifically or for that consortium. Um, so that eats up a good portion of many of my days is some some bits of meetings. Um, and then there's just that team development meeting with my team members. Um, I'll, I'll have one on one meetings every week and I'll, with each member and then we also have our team meetings. And then just the day-to-day -day sitting at my desk kind of work. Um, I spend a lot of time digging into data. We make a lot of decisions based on how our users are using our library, how they're using our resources. Um, we do a lot of research on how to what other libraries are doing um, because a lot of times our students don't know what else is out there. And so we're trying to get out there and get ahead of it so we can introduce those great resources to the students. Um, that includes just kind of exploring what what our what physically we have for the students as far as the space is concerned. And so our what types of seatings do seating do we have? The rolling marker boards, do they want the big ones? Do they want the little ones? Do they want them on the wall? Do they want them as a table? Um, and so we spend a lot of time collecting that data. Um, our students might see us, our faculty staff might see our, our student workers roaming the building um, periodically with an iPad in hand. They're going around taking account of how many people are in the building um, every other hour of the day so that we know how many people are here, what space they're using the most. And so do we need to recreate that space somewhere else because it's getting too full? Um, do we need to reallocate space differently? Uh, and just to show our usage, um, it's really impactful to let people know how many students are using the library and how many are coming and staying. And that's why we use the head count is to, to show that they're not just coming through the door, but they're also coming and staying for long periods of time. It's interesting you mentioned making decisions based on data, because I'd say, you know, I've been in Northwest for a long time. And in my time here, of all of the places on campus, the library has probably changed the most from... Yeah when I was a student to when I started as a staff member to now, it seems like things are constantly changing and improving. So mm -hmm. it's good to see that there's data that backs that up and that it's, you know, it's all purposeful. So it's been, yeah. it's an awesome space. So. Yeah. When I was the GA in the library, we still had what is now novel grounds by Starbucks was the, the computer lab. And then I graduated from my master's program at Northwest in May. And I started in this position in July and in those two months is when we move. They were moving out all the front, all of the um, computer lab furniture, and changing it over to the Starbucks space. And so, um, yeah, it, that's right off the bat. When I first started, there was a huge change that happened to first floor. Um, within a year, um, we had removed nearly all of the ranges that were on second floor and that floor used to be full of ranges um, where we have the learning and teaching or the student success center now um, that used to all be stacks of books media um, children's juvenile books things like that um, now it's a completely open space with movable furniture and so, you know, each year we've, you know, something else trying to make more space because they're coming, our students are coming and using the library and we know they need that space for studying and group work. And so we're trying to create spaces um, and just move things around a little bit. You know, sometimes people worry that we're getting rid of books. We're not, they're just spread out a little bit more on first. And then there are a lot, most of them are up on third. And then we do have to expand how we provide books because we have so many online learners now that we cannot do it the traditional way only um, and having physical books because we have so many online learners who need access as well. And so we, we get um, the eBooks in place of some of our physical books, especially for those online programs. I know, you know, there's always been kind of a little bit of a discussion, right? 
should we have the library open 24 hours a day? Can you speak to, can you speak to that? I would just love oh. a public forum for this discussion. Oh, Hannah. That's I'm a tough one. Can of worms. <laughs> Yeah, it no, it's it's a good question because we do get a lot of folks who ask about it. That's part of why we use that headcount so much is to show our numbers dramatically drop off at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock by midnight. We close at midnight right now during pre-finals and finals week, we, we are open until 1 a.m. Um, you know, we're always willing to explore a little bit of that. Um, you'll hear stories about, oh, but this library is 24 seven. And it's like, yes, that's a research institution with, you know, triple the number of students that we have. Um, and so the, we use our traffic to help guide our decision-making and how we, and what hours of operation we have. One of the things we're doing, um, this semester is extending those finals hours on Friday. Uh, we used to close at five and we're going to stay open until seven this year and try it and see if it works. And if that, if they're coming in and they're staying, then we're going to, you know, look at our hours for Friday and see if we need to change them. Um, but yeah, we just, we don't have the numbers right now that warrant the amount of staff that it would take to run the entire building. And so we try to, when we have just a couple people and, and we don't see a lot of use of our um, materials, like our circulation at the desk. And so they're coming and using the building. And so are there other options for the two, you know, two or three students who might be needing that space, you know, two or three times a semester. But we do, like I said, we watch that traffic so that we know, okay, our traffic is telling us we're not open late enough. So we're kicking, you know, 40 people out of the building at midnight that's telling us that maybe we should be looking at that time and maybe even that time of the semester. And but those yeah, online resources are there 24 hours a day for them yes, too, right? Yeah, yep. So what are some of those, I think, you know, a lot of our students know the library, they go and they study there, they get their coffee there, they hang out there, but they, I don't know that many are as, are as aware of all the stuff that you guys do have like online as far as research and then the Mobius network. What are some of those resources that, that students maybe aren't using as much as they need to that are out there for all of them? Um, the number one thing I'm going to say is the librarians. Um, we have a lot of students who use them and, and um, take advantage of that amazing resource. That resource is available in person or online through our library chat. And we do get quite a few chats. It's um, grown in popularity over the last couple of years, which is great. Um, but it is a resource that, uh, that, you know, it, I wish I would have known more sooner about it as an undergrad because I didn't know about that service either. And so that's one of the things the library is constantly looking into is how do we make sure our students know that this resource is available to them. Um, but we have some great librarians who are there to help with research. Um, they, they can get you connected with the online tools that we have uh, in relation going on beyond that, you know, just the library, the librarian as a person, but the online resources, we have access um, to countless databases, journal titles. Um, and then when you can't find it in our library, that's when my side of the house can step in and help. Um, because we have what we call interlibrary loan, where we share materials between libraries. You mentioned Mobius. Mobius is where we share our physical books. And they just went online with a new article reach where we can share articles between libraries. But we even have a whole nother network called OCLC um, where you can, um, world share is what most people know it as, um, where we can get access to articles that we don't own for our students. And so it's, it's borrowing it from another library for academic use. Um, and so we really want our students to know that that resource exists. Um, when you hit a block, that we don't actually own it in our library, don't assume that you can't get it because we probably can get it for you. There are a few things out there that are just, we can't get our hands on, but many of them we can. Um, and a lot of the time at no cost to the student, I'd say the majority of the time, no cost to the student, faculty or staff. Um, yeah, I said the chat is great. We also have research guides that are online that are a really great tool um, to helping our students be academically su successful. Some are generic for like citing um, and with the different citation styles, but then we have specific ones for different classes, particularly in our um, uh, core courses that have resources linked directly in the 
in the LibGuide to help the, the student finding the resources they need for their assignments. Um, going beyond just online, we have in the building, of course, our open spaces. We have marker board tables. We have rolling marker boards. We have marker boards on the wall. Those are hugely popular. Um, multiple spaces for groups to meet. Um, but one of the other resources um, that once you learn about it, you know, you're using it a lot, a lot at the time is our study rooms. We have individual and group study rooms. So if you need some space to get away, I always needed complete silence. And so um, study rooms were an ideal location for me. And then group work, having a room with a projector, a marker board is very beneficial when you're meeting as a group. Um, yeah. What else am I? Oh, and then of course, all of at our at the library services desk, we have a, a plethora of equipment that students can check out, including power cords. So the, the big piece there is we don't want you to come to the library and leave before you intended to because your laptop died or because your cell phone died. Um, we have those at the desk for students to check out. So if they want to come and stay, we have most of the many of the tools that they might need to do that. There's more. Okay. I just <laughs> naming all of them. I actually use the citation guides almost every single day. Those citation gu guides are brilliant. They're really, yeah. really good. Um, you employ a lot of students yes. at, you know, to run the library services desk. Um, what are you looking for in a student employee? If I was a student who was really interested in working there, um, and what do you look for in an employee in general? What makes someone a good match with working in the library? So particularly with our student employees, because they're frontline staff they, at the library services desk, we really need people skills. We need customer service skills. Um, you don't necessarily have to have any specific job experience prior to applying for a job in the library. Um, we just need you to sell that you can engage with people, that you can be, that you can provide quality customer service. And so um, that's our number one thing we're looking for. Also be very thorough in completing your application. <laughs> um, we, we talk about it, but we know that there are great candidates who don't even make it to the interview pool because they didn't fully fill out their application. And that just when you're getting, when you're looking at the whole picture of all the applicants that come through, when some, when some, many of them do the whole, um, kit, complete everything, submit the cover letter, submit the resume, complete the questions. Um, you're just going to quickly move down the line because, you know, we're, we can learn more about the other person, sell yourself to us. Um, you know, a lot of times we get cover letters that are addressed to, you know, somebody else across campus. So make sure you're, um, you know, I still read it. I still use it to understand who you are as a person, but that's kind of that attention to detail that we want to make sure that you're, because in the library, aside from customer service, attention to detail is very important because a book can get lost very easily. Um, and we that's you'll see signs in the library and you have these book carts and you're always like, oh, I feel bad putting this book on this cart and not just putting it back. But if you put it back in the wrong spot, we could be months before we find it because we do constantly do inventory. But if it just gets on the wrong shelf, just, just four shelves down, we may not find it because we aren't you know, shelf reading every single title every single day. And so um, that attention to detail is important because our, our students are the ones who put the books back out um, or go, find, go looking for them. And so we need you to have that attention to detail. Um, and yeah, just being able to engage with your colleagues. Um, we, you know, our students have, um, we need flexibility with scheduling. We have, you know, hours all the way until 1215 at night. And so um, and then we also are open the, on Saturdays and Sundays. And so we need that flexibility in the schedule to keep, to keep the building open as, as long as we do. Um, yeah, those would be the big things for student employment. Any other words of wisdom as far as, you know, maybe I want, what, what does somebody have to do to work in a library or even to become a librarian? I know you're assistant library director. You're not a librarian, but mm -hmm. you could explain that to us. Um, so yeah, I guess it kind of depends on what your ultimate goal is. So if you want to work in the library as a student, like I said, um, 
submit that that resume cover letter, sell yourself, talk about the skills you bring to the table. Even if you haven't worked in a library, which most of our students have not, um, if you can speak to your experience in providing customer service, even in a volunteer capacity um, or in a group or an organization that you were part of in high school, that helps us understand how you'll be able to engage with our public when you're working at the desk. Um, and so, yeah, so if you're interested at just the student level, that's the starting point. If you want to go on and make a career out of libraries, part of it is where, where do you want to work in the library? Um, but like, I don't have a library science degree. I have the counseling degree and I have the higher ed leadership degree. If you want to be a librarian and work on the other side of the house, that is our um, research services, then you'll want to go on and, and pursue a master's in library science and MLS. And so, um, but as an undergrad at Northwest, if that's your ultimate goal, trying to get your foot in the door working in the library would be a really great start. Also, good field experience, um, profession-based learning, making sure that you know that this is where you want to be um, before you start down that path in your master's program. Um, yeah, and then, you know, the, the, there's not any programs in Northwest Missouri, but there are other programs in mid-Missouri that offer a, an MLS if you're wanting to stay in the state, but it goes far beyond that as well. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was great getting to talk with you. Yeah. Yeah, it was great talking to you too. And definitely if you are a Northwest student and you haven't been into B.D. Owens Library and check out all the cool stuff going on, go in there and check it out. There's lots of cool stuff happening there. Plus you can get Starbucks while you're in there too. So right. yep. double win. And whiteboard tables. I mean, yep. that's personally my favorite thing. Yeah. So. And those were born out of, we had upright tables and they would flip them on top of the table. So literally the students were telling us without speaking to us, we want whiteboard tables. And so that's part of that, just constantly assessing what's happening in the library. Yep. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tara. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, that will do it for another episode of Behind the Bearcat, and we'll talk to you next time. Hey, guys, we hope you enjoyed that episode. Don't forget that you can find the audio version of the podcast on your podcast platform of choice. New episodes come out every Friday, and you can connect with us on social media on both Twitter and Instagram. Thank you for joining us for Behind the Bearcat, and we'll talk to you next time.